In tonight's episode, I've compiled some of the most mysterious, disturbing, and terrifying cases of things in the national parks, from missing persons to paranormal phenomena and eyewitness accounts. This is two hours of high strangeness within our own national parks. Enjoy. Joel Thomason, 31 of Denair, had set out to go on a hike on September 6th from the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir all the way out to Lake Eleanor which is roughly about a nine mile, or for those of you that are not in the States, 14 kilometers away, and he had originally planned to return to the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir by September 9th, which was only about three days. It was then that he was declared missing on that Saturday, and immediately, Yosemite National Park officials had released a statement declaring these things as well as his general description. He was seen as being about five feet, 10 inches, had a buzz cut brown hair, and last carrying a yellow and gray backpack a green sleeping bag, a blue and green hammock, and a red inflatable kayak. They deeply urged anybody who has been in the area of Miguel Meadow, Lake Eleanor, or the trails surrounding the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir to alert authorities if they know of his whereabouts. Because once the search ensued, Yosemite Search and Rescue were able to find no trace of him at all. In fact, Amanda Thomason, his wife, had made a Facebook post on a Sunday right after he was declared missing that at least 16 National Park Service Search and Rescue crew members along with their dogs were looking for her lost husband. In fact, the entire county of Tuolumne even joined in on the search and rescue mission in search of him, also bringing along equipment and helicopters and kayaks and boat to try and get the general perimeter of where he was last seen in hopes they would find some trace of him. But unfortunately, to this day in 2022, there's still no trace of Joel Thomason. Is it possible that like many of the other missing hikers who disappear in all the national parks, he was potentially snatched up, killed, or taken by something? Could he have perhaps fallen into a crevice or fell off a cliff? That could very well be likely, but don't you think with all of these experienced search personnel and outdoor caravans searching for him, they would at least find a trace of him. It doesn't make sense that so many of these hikers just seem to disappear without a trace. And the trail he was taking from the Hetch Hetchy to Lake Eleanor isn't exactly off the beaten path. In fact, the entire trail system within Yosemite National Park is all well traversed with people around and people coming and going. So it's not like he had just wandered off by himself into the deep woods completely without any idea of where he was going, which makes his disappearance all the more strange like the many thousands of others who are just like him who disappear without a single trace. I would love to know what you guys think. Could there be dragons living beneath Yellowstone? A few landmarks in Yellowstone National Park are more infamous than its geysers. An estimated 500 such features can be found within its borders, the densest concentration of active geysers anywhere on planet Earth, encompassing about half of all known examples in the world. Along with the geysers, the geothermal activity underneath Yellowstone fuels various other sites, from hot springs to boiling pools of mud. After feeling the massive heat and plumes of steam arising from these same locations, early settlers to the area were inspired by mythical stories of terrifying reptilian beasts and lent these feature names like Dragon's Mouth Spring and Black Dragon Cauldron. But such creatures may not be as mythical as we might think, especially in Yellowstone National Park. You see, the July 30th, 1886 edition of Virginia's Alexandria Gazette it carried a surprising story borrowed from Cinnabar, Montana's pioneer press. The story claimed that two tourists had hired a stagecoach driver to escort them through Yellowstone. Along the way, they were shocked to spot a massive shape, around 30 feet long, passing through some of the tall grass near Yellowstone Lake. The tourist said it resembled a gigantic reptile, in fact, so tall that it carried its head 10 to 15 feet above the ground, suspended on a long neck. The entire time, the beast exuded a sinister hissing sound. The tourists immediately reported their sighting to the park authorities, and a search party was now organized overnight to pursue the beast. Now, according to the Alexandria Gazette, Colonel David W. Ware, superintendent of the park and his assistant, a park guide captain Jack Baronet, led a posse of hunters deep into the wilderness. They made their way to Yellowstone Lake, where they eventually stumbled upon a cave alongside an extinct geyser. Now, 
The men reportedly heard the insidious hiss themselves moments before a large reptilian head struck out from the cave and stretched at least 15 feet beyond the entrance before immediately recoiling. It's easy, perhaps even wise, to view such a story within the context of the era's lax journalistic standards. Newspapers were by no means above publishing fabricated falsehoods to increase sales, so there also doesn't seem to have been any sort of follow-up to this fantastic story. Now, certainly such a discovery would have prompted hordes of hunters to descend upon Yellowstone in an attempt to capture said creature. However, researcher John LeMay looked into the details of this very 1886 story and uncovered many aspects lending to its credibility. You see, both Ware and Baronet were actually people serving in Yellowstone National Park at this time. Baronet actually built and operated the very first bridge across the Yellowstone River in 1871, and his name event lent to a mountain Baronet Peak. David W. Ware, on the other hand, was indeed the park superintendent during those years and was credited with being a thoroughly honest man, later becoming a United States congressman. Of course, your mileage may vary today on whether or not congress members and honesty go hand in hand, but that's besides the point. Perhaps someday in the future, scientists will discover the bones of a dinosaur in the furthest recesses of a long-forgotten cave in Yellowstone National Park, and declare the remains too recent to be fossils, because until then, we are left wondering whether Yellowstone's dragon was fact or fiction. Spencer and his girlfriend at the time went for a lovely hike slash camping trip in the Lind Camp Falls area in the Great Smoky Mountain National Forest. It is a long, narrow valley with a stream running down the center. On either side of the stream are thickly wooded hillsides that rise sharply to meet the ridgeline. The park boundary is at the far end of the valley where the stream exits via a small cascade. There are several picnic areas along both sides of the stream with a few small hiking trails that lead into the woods. On this particular night, they had pitched their tent in an unoccupied picnic area on the west side of the stream or the most remote area in this section. It was right around 10.05 p.m. and they had just finished dinner when they had heard the first howl. Spencer will never forget it as long as he lives. It was this long, mournful wail that seemed to come from all directions at once. It was unlike anything Spencer and his girlfriend at the time had ever heard before. The howl seemed to resonate in his chest and he could feel the vibrations, the deep bass tones in his chest, more so in his body than his ears, if that makes any sense. His girlfriend at the time looks at him and says, we need to go in the tent, and a voice that instructed him that she was scared to death. And so trying to comfort her, they did so immediately. The howl sounded like it was too loud for any animal they'd ever heard. It had the same quality as if you had heard a amplified sound of a human voice through a bullhorn. The howl seemed to be right outside the tent, but Spencer nor his girlfriend could identify the source. It was too loud and deep to simply be a coyote and they'd never heard anything like it before or since. That night is when they had heard something heavy moving around outside their tent. His girlfriend at the time began to panic, thinking it was a large black bear, but Spencer had assured her that bears don't sound like that. He went outside with a flashlight and found no tracks around his tent, but he could still hear it moving around in the brush nearby. Whatever it was, it knew that they were there and seemed to be playing with Spencer and his girlfriend, kind of the way a predator does. Then the smell hit Spencer, and he described this as an odor of rotting flesh and sulfur. It was the foulest, putrid smell he has ever encountered. He says it was so bad that it burned his nostrils and made him gag. The odor seemed to be the strongest right outside the tent on the east side, but he couldn't identify where the source was coming from. It was too foul to be a dead animal and too strong for anything that size. Spencer admits though, in that moment, he was feeling pretty brave with his Glock 19 and a bullet chambered ready to go. As he shone his light around, looking for any signs of anything, his light illuminated a large shadow just off in the brush from him. And once the flashlight spilled on it, it immediately jumped up and turned to look in his direction, as if he had startled something and it had been exposed. And he kid you not, he instantly dove for the tent out of reaction from his own body, like he knows that whatever this was, wasn't a human and he had to escape. He climbs back in the tent with his girlfriend looking at him like he's crazy. And he did not tell her what he saw because 
He didn't want her to be any more scared than she already was. He was now terrified. He had the tent zipped up, his hand still on his Glock, and his flashlight waiting for what was to happen next. Everything around went quiet, including the crickets and all night sounds. And all they could hear is the sound of something really big and heavy moving around in the brush all around their tent. And this went on for hours afterwards, but eventually it left and never came back. Spencer has gone on to tell me that he's had other weird experiences in the woods, but this one still stands out as the most bizarre and terrifying. Whatever it was, it knew they were there and seemed to be playing with them. That's what he got out of it. Spencer and his girlfriend at the time did not hear it again, but they were both too scared to sleep. And once daylight had broke the following morning, they packed up and left as soon as they could. They did not return to the park for several years after. They still have the tent and all the gear from that trip, but they'll never forget this one. And the smell, the smell, Spencer says, will haunt him forever. Not even roadkill during a hot, humid Tennessee summer will match that odor. Santa Fe National Forest, inaugurated on July 1st, 1915, by the United States Forest Service, with altitudes ranging from 5,300 feet to 13,000 feet at the highest of the peak, located within the Pecos Wilderness. It is here that strange, inexplicable wooden constructions, some of the structures appear to be rudimentary, teepee-like structures that could be used for shelter, Others appear to be a solid cones of wood, having been spontaneously appearing all throughout the wilderness. Each of these is reportedly constructed over 1,000 pieces of wood from fallen trees and tree limbs, ranging in size, some even being over 20 feet tall with a diameter of 12 feet. There's no clue as to who is building these structures and why they are being built, or even how they are being built. This is partly due to the large pieces most likely needing some kind of machinery to move and place in position. Now, there are many worker protests that these structures claiming that they could cause and or fuel forest fires, and that the fire hazards these structures create, as well as their stability, are very concerning to many authorities. They believe that if these structures were to fall or collapse while people are near, there could be severe injuries. It has also been said that anybody caught constructing these could be fined up to $5,000 or spend time in jail for up to six months. It's even taken so seriously that crews will work tirelessly to take down the structures, but they seem to be built just as quickly as they are dismantled. And many different ideas circulate about what these structures are and why they are being built. The most common theory being that they are the work of a cult that uses the constructions for ceremonial functions. Well, Sam B. Dubal disappeared on October 9th, 2020 in Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State. At only 33 years old, he was very fit and very adamant about doing this solo hike that he had been so excited to do. And as solo hikes are, it's pretty much expected to be returning the following day because you shouldn't be gone for days on end, at least not with this trail loop. Sam was even spotted that day on the Mother Mountain trail loop, so he was in good spirits and alive and healthy. But then day turned to night and day turned to night again, and before you know it, no one's heard from Sam at all. And finally, on October 12th of 2020, Sam was officially reported as missing. Mount Rainier is considered one of the most dangerous places to solo hike. And this is due in part for several reasons. Number one is because it has a very high chance of volcanic eruptions, but also the high amount of hiking deaths that have been reported. And you couple that in with misadventures and icy slopes that people fall down and die, foul play, and all the other reasons that people go missing or die. It just makes for a dangerous national park to solo explore by yourself in terms of numbers. But our Samuel was aware of this and had prepped accordingly. He had a cell phone, he had plenty of equipment with him, he had an overnight tent. I mean, this man was not a newbie, he was an experienced solo hiker. In fact, this was not his first solo hiking experience either. So to many, this was very strange and surprising that Sam would just turn up missing. Mount Rainier at a staggering 14,000 plus foot summit also known by others as Tacoma, is an extremely large and active stratovolcano in the Cascade Range of the Pacific Northwest. Mount Rainier is actually located within Mount Rainier National Park, who'd have thunk that, about roughly 60 miles southeast of Seattle. It is the highest mountain in the state of Washington and the Cascade Range alone. Sam Dubal was not an avid hiker, but also an extremely intelligent college graduate. Having earned his degree, his PhD, mind you, in medical anthropology from UC Berkeley in 2018, he was a man of logic, reason, and intelligence. And in doing so, had even begun to teach at Washington State's Anthropology University Department starting in June of 2020. Every 
everyone he had worked with, from colleagues to students to friends, all claimed he was a very, very intellectual man, quick-witted, smart, and loved the outdoors. The Mount Rainier park rangers who operated in search and rescue for Sam searched and searched for nine days without finding any evidence of Sam ever existing on the mountain. There were not only hikers and volunteers searching by foot, but they had helicopters scanning the entire perimeter of the trail he was last seen on, going over subalpine meadows, dense pine forests, rocky terrain, and even around bodies of water all in search for Sam. At this point, Sam was assumed to be dead. Unfortunately, shortly thereafter the search, winter storms had begun raging through the areas, dropping the temperatures dramatically in the area. And unfortunately, with all the search efforts involved, Sam is still noted as having not been found. Michigan park rangers can explain the mysteries, the strange disappearances, and the almost supernatural phenomena surrounding the Lake Michigan Triangle. As a matter of fact, in February, of 1978, a man by the name of Stephen Kubaki happened to go missing mysteriously under strange and bizarre circumstances. However, his recovery was even more bizarre than you could ever imagine. Stephen, who at the time was around 23 years of age and was busy attending a small Christian university known as Hope College on the southeastern section of Lake Michigan. He was a pretty normal guy by societal standards, very free-spirited, very intelligent, and like many who have gone missing in the past, an avid backpacker, hiker, he had climbed mountains, this guy was an all-around outdoorsman fanatic, which is why on this rendezvous, of being out in the wild, he was cross-country skiing in Lake Michigan. His original intention was only to be gone for maybe a day, if not more than that. But obviously, once he failed to return, friends and family immediately knew that something had happened. It was actually when Sagatuck snowmobilers had happened across his abandoned cross-country skis and a backpack thought to belong to Kubaki that then the authorities had been alerted. After recently receiving information of his disappearance, it did not take long for them to put two and two together. Together, therefore assuming that these obviously belong to Kubaki. When they had gone to investigate, they had found over 200 yards of feed prints leading past the edge of Lake Michigan. Therefore, it was concluded, or at least theorized, that he had somehow walked over into the water and had fallen through a patch of ice, therefore falling into the icy waters below and dying. However, even though that was the widely accepted theory of what happened to Kubaki, that was not the end of his search. After several long days of relentless searching from land and air personnel, they were unable to turn up anything that would prove that Kubaki was still alive and well. It's as if he had just disappeared and vanished into the thin air. After a multitude of attempts to find any trace of Steven, all hope was lost after some time, and it was eventually just noted that he had disappeared and he was gone. Now, here's where the story has a twist. Fast forward all the way to May 5th, 1979, and our hero, Stephen Kubaki, is waking up in a grassy knoll just outside of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. The sun is shining, there's grass and flowers all around him, it is in the heart of spring, and here he is waking up, fully conscious of himself and where he's at, and he realizes, not only where am I, but He's wearing an entirely different outfit than he last remembers. He has a brand new pair of sunglasses. He has a brand new pair of sneakers. And he has a backpack full of strange hiking and hitchhiking equipment that is not his that he had somehow acquired. In fact, he even had a shirt from a Wisconsin marathon he supposedly ran and equipment that would lead him to believe that he had traveled to Chicago, Utah, San Francisco. Completely startled by all of this, he found a way to hitchhike to the nearest town, which was Pittsfield, where he was able to obtain a newspaper that would show the actual date, and the date read May 5th, 1979. He was startled by this and could not comprehend where the last 14 and a half months had gone of his life, nor could he account for it. What's strange is that Stephen could remember vividly up to the very point that he had lost consciousness and then somehow remembers waking up in this grassy knoll. Pittsfield, Massachusetts is 700 plus miles away from his original missing location. And as soon as he could, he fortunately had relatives, his aunt, living in Great Barrington, which is roughly 20 miles away from his current location now in Pittsfield. So he somehow managed to find a ride from Pittsfield to his aunt's house where he was then reunited with his long lost family. 
or long lost to him, of course. Of course, after he had been found, or found himself, I guess you would call it, he was asked by news reporters and family, what happened, where did you go? How have you just been gone for 14 and a half months without any trace? And he had zero explanation. In fact, the only thing he could remember was that he was trudging through the snow, fearing the darkness and cold setting in, so he took time to sit and rest, and the last thing he could really remember or make out as an explanation was that the cold must have overcome him or sheer exhaustion. And after he lost consciousness, he knows no more. Now, how this man mysteriously traveled over 700 miles east and had acquired an entire new wardrobe, sneakers, sunglasses, and new gear and equipment is beyond anyone's guess. In fact, Kubaki was so puzzled by this, he even told reporters that he was determined to backtrack and find out as best he could what exactly happened and why. A very interesting theory about this case is that he was somehow affected by the Lake Michigan Triangle. Now, if you haven't heard of the Lake Michigan Triangle, it's very similar to the Bermuda Triangle, where it has a history of all sorts of strange sightings and phenomena, from ships disappearing to people vanishing, people seeing apparitions, and all sorts of strange stuff going on. This next story was submitted to be by an anonymous park ranger who wanted to be referred to as Stephen. At this time that it happened, he was doing his nightly rounds in 2011, and he patrolled the Yosemite Valley. And at this time, it was roughly 11.10 p.m., and he remembers this vividly because of the image on the dashboard sticking out in his mind. Currently at the time, he was on a road called Northside Drive when he noticed what appeared to be a man or figure moving off the field to his right-hand side. Thinking that it was a potential hiker or camper who needed help, who was maybe trying to wave his truck down, he pulls over to get a better look, and as he did, he sees that this figure actually stands up and when it stood up, Stephen was horrified by what he saw because this wasn't just a person coming towards his truck. It wasn't a Bigfoot, but the person didn't have any definition. Usually, if it was a hiker or somebody in need, you could clearly see from the distance he was at, which was maybe 30 yards at most, you could see clothing, you could see facial hair or hair, depending on the lighting conditions, but Stephen didn't see any of those things. In fact, he would describe it as just a black shadow, but clearly a person in shape, or at least a human being. And as he looked and began to squint and study what he was looking at, because the moonlight only provided so much illumination, he said that this figure began to slowly levitate and almost glide in the air towards his direction. Stephen, in complete shock, holding his wheel, not sure how to react or what to do or say, watched as this figure glided about 25 feet and then just seemed to dissipate into nothing. Stephen had no idea how to comprehend what he was even looking at. I mean, he was still confused and just puzzled by what he had just seen. Afterwards, he was rubbing his eyes and thinking to himself, did that really happen? Did I hallucinate? Am I sleep deprived? So he quickly goes back to the ranger station, gets himself a cup of coffee because he's thinking he's just out of his mind at this point. Doesn't tell anybody for a while. Now, what's very interesting with Steven is he wrote that the following morning, he had spoken to a couple of hikers and tourists in that general area, and they were asking him about a mysterious black figure that was scaring people. In fact, one of the men who had spoken to Steven was an older gentleman, and he had told him that this person had spooked him and his wife all night because it was trying to peer into their camper's windows and trying to rattle and open the door. But every time they looked, they would just see this dark figure moving around their RV. And they all gave him the same description. Nobody said anything about it being a Bigfoot or anything like that, but they just saw it as a dark figure, but couldn't really make out any features or details, which they just assumed because of the lack of light. Another woman, a mother of three whom Steven spoke to, described a very similar scenario. Her and her kids were up late roasting marshmallows over the fire when one of her boys had pointed out over towards the wood line and saw this person standing there by the tree watching them. But she described in horror as this figure or person had red glowing eyes, but was just the shape of a man, but black, all black like a shadow. And she described to Stephen that she felt pure evil coming from this person or thing or whatever it was and immediately got the boys in the tent and had pulled out her firearm ready in case anything happened. Although nothing did happen. After Stephen had corroborated the details between this older gentleman and this mom of three, the time that this happened was about an hour or two before his own sighting in that general area 
which means it's very possible that Steven did in fact see the same shadow person that these people did. It's unknown at the time if anybody else in the general area saw the same thing. These are the only two witnesses that Steven had corroborated with. After he had time to process the sighting, he never really did bother telling anybody else about it and still struggles to talk about it now for the fear that somebody will think he's crazy, which is part of the reason he did not want me to personally use his name and asked that I use the name Steven. So what do you guys think of this case? Is it mere coincidence that three different people, including a park ranger, saw the same thing? Or is there truly a black apparition or shadow person that was wandering through Yosemite National Park that evening? Back on March 17th, 2012, a Derek Luking happened to mysteriously vanish in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park without a trace. What's interesting about Derek's case is he actually had a note that was left on his car that simply read, don't try to follow me. This already led many people to believe that this was possibly a suicide trip where he would probably just go off into the woods and maybe fall off a cliff or whatever he had planned. But that did not stop search and rescue personnel and family and friends from looking for Derek. Park rangers and search personnel already realized that trying to find Derek would prove incredibly difficult. And at this point in time, it had already been several days since anybody had even heard from Derek. Derek, about 24 or so years of age at the time of his disappearance, had worked as an orderly at the Peninsula Behavioral Health Center located in Tennessee. But what's odd about Derek's disappearance that alludes to more of a potential suicide case is that he had just stopped showing up to work one day. And this went on for several days. And when his family had found out, like any family, they grew very concerned. And that's when they tried reaching out to him, but he would not answer their calls, nor would he return their phone calls. The family speculate that all of this coincides with the disappearance and probably death of his grandfather, whom he was very close with. And it just so happens that Derek's disappearance also matches the anniversary of his grandfather's death, leading many close friends and family to speculate and theorize that this was probably a case of him opting out due to him not being able to handle the loss of his grandfather, which is very common among many people. The family at one point or another discovered that Derek was actually staying at a hotel in North Carolina. And once they tried to seek him out and arrived at the hotel, he had already been long gone. As his family was making their way back to Tennessee, they actually happened upon his parked car on Newfound Gap Road and immediately began calling it in. The area in which he was parked is right where the Appalachian Trail crosses the Newfound Gap Road, which would lead many to believe that he just up, got out of his car, and went on the trail to opt himself out, probably. Once law enforcement and other investigators began to search his vehicle, they had found the note that said, don't try and follow me, which again, supports the original theory. However, many Great Smoky Mountain National Park officials expressed several doubts about whether the note was actually Derek's or not. After looking inside of Derek's car, they found his wallet full of credit cards, his ID, as well as several supplies like sleeping bags and tents, and even a map of the park which marks everything. What's even more bizarre is all of these things that he had with him, he had just recently purchased, which would allude to him going to use these things for potentially hiking or going on a trip. So it doesn't make sense that he would go and buy these things and yet go off and opt himself out. So while that is a popular theory, maybe there's truly something else going on. And at this point, questions began arising left and right. Had he simply walked into the woods without any gear to help him in the late winter time? And if so, why had he done that? Or was there possibly another reason behind it? Another reason that could have been more sinister and unexplainable. Perhaps he was lured. Perhaps he had fled his car in fear or even at gunpoint. We will never know. As a matter of fact, this story had gained so much attention from national media that one of Derek's friends had actually gone on to talk to CNN and inform them that Derek was a huge fan of the Bear Grylls TV show, Man vs. Wild. And because of that, he could have easily set off in search of an adventure to try and prove to everyone he could do it and clear his mind and try and get some peace from the wild. And even his friend had said that Derek was not a newbie to the wilderness. He had all the equipment and supplies and knowledge he would need to survive a trek out in the woods. So this only made his case much more perplexing. Now, park rangers were not so sure that the gear he had would have been fit for the trek he was trying to do. 
if he was trying to do a track at all. And as a matter of fact, many of the park rangers working on Derek's case were not at all convinced that the equipment Derek had supposedly brought with him would suffice in half million acres of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 60 separate searchers and three separate dog teams scoured the woods looking for Derek, searching over 70 miles worth of trails and woods near where his car was found, not being able to find anything. And they really pushed the limits of how far they were going to search. They were rappling down cliff faces and searching behind and in any crevices or any nooks and crannies they could possibly find with no trace of Derek anywhere. And pretty soon, like wildfire, Appalachian trail hikers were now spreading the word to anyone who would listen and who was passing through the area, hoping to find a trace of Derek somewhere. But despite the presence of many people going in and out of the park, especially during this time of the year where it was beautiful and lots of sunshine, no one had seen Derek anywhere, all throughout the Smoky Mountain. And it wasn't long before people began considering the fact that he had most likely gone off the trail, whether that be purposeful or not was a different story, but that it would probably be much harder to try and find him. And by the time that March 23rd had rolled around, there was still zero evidence for Derek anywhere other than his vehicle and the note and the supplies he had, there was no trace of him to be found. And it was at this point that the search was now scaled back into smaller groups of searchers to try and stay on more populated areas, hoping they would find something of him. What makes this case even more interesting is on Sunday, March 18th, only days into the search for Derek, a second man separate from Derek had vanished into the Great Smoky Mountains right near Newfound Gap. His name was Michael Cochini. He was about 23 years of age, and he too was from Nashville, Tennessee. And what's strange about him is he was last seen outside of a Walmart area that same Sunday afternoon. And like Derek, a search party of park rangers and other search rescue personnel was made up to try and find any trace of this other man. But like Derek, nothing turned up. Unlike Derek's case, however, Michael was not at all an avid fan of the outdoors, nor was he a hiker or anyone enthusiastic about going out in the Smoky Mountains. So the fact that he actually went out there is a mystery. If we fast forward to the future on August 21st, 2012, searchers would actually find several items that they believed were consistent with what Michael had carried on him last and believed they belonged to him. And not too far from those remaining items found was skull fragments. On September 6th, 2012, a close examination of the remains found by the county medical examiner's office in the Knoxville region came to the conclusion that yes, these are indeed Michael Cuccini's remains. What's bizarre about this is that these remains of his were only found roughly three tenths of a mile from where his car was found all the way back in March. And still, at this point, while they had found Michael Cuccini's remains, Derek was still nowhere to be found. And while they weren't exactly sure how Michael Caccini had died, there was much suspicion about him taking his own life out there. And that that was the primary reason why he went out there in seclusion was to opt himself out, unfortunately. And where one book reaches its closing chapter, the Derek Luking story still remains unknown. In fact, his missing persons case remains open to this day because according to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, Derek simply just walked off into the woods and never came back out. And by this point, he has been missing for over 10 years. Is it possible that he set off to end his life or did something else more nefarious happen to him? Did he get spooked and run and fall off a cliff and somehow injure himself and was left to die or was the note in his car truly his and he went off to take care of his own business by opting himself out, unable to cope with the loss of his grandfather whom he was very close with. I'll let you guys be the judge. This next story is also submitted by a previous park ranger. Her name is Kit and she used to be a volunteer ranger in Yosemite from 2014 to 2016. And during her time there, she had a very disturbing experience with something she thought she would never see. Something she describes as from her nightmares. Her sighting or experience took place near the Tuolumne Meadows in the evening of spring of 2015. Her and a friend who also happened to be a volunteer ranger were assigned to the evening patrol of the Tuolumne Meadows. This was right around 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., somewhere right in there. It was a beautiful spring evening and the sun was just barely cresting over the horizon. So there was just a little bit of light left, enough that it wasn't completely pitch black, but you still had to use your headlights. 
So she was patrolling the meadows in their Jeep, and at one point in the road, her and her partner noticed movement in a grove of trees right near the road. And this is exactly where it happened. As they begin to slow down, thinking that wildlife was about to come onto the road, they would be correct, this strange creature began to lumber out onto the road from the cluster of trees. At first, they both thought it was a bear, but as they adjusted their eyes and watched this more, they realized this was not a creature they had ever seen before. It was massive, at least five feet tall on all fours, and it had a large head with longish brown hair and yellow eyes that glowed in the light. What they were looking at resembled a bear to an extent, but she claims, Kit claims, that it resembles more of a really large wolf, except it was bigger and more pronounced with larger, sharper teeth that she said did not belong. And as it clambered out onto the walkway or onto the road, it turned in their direction facing the headlights and kind of glowered at them. Kit claims that its front paws were massive and almost resembled more like hands than they did paws. I mean, this thing was a hulking, deformed wolf, and patches of the fur on its body from the light appeared to be a light gray color. It was also more tapered at the waist and appeared thinner, but also very muscular and looked very strong. And her and her partner completely in disbelief staring at this thing, they both just sat there with their jaw wide open, not sure how to even begin to intake what they were looking at. This thing lets out this howl that shook her and her friend up pretty badly, and then begin to slowly backpedal away from them, still on all fours the entire time, with a scowl on its face, like it was angry that they had even seen this thing. Then, it stops, right as it's backing up off the road. And what happens next, Kit describes as something that only happens in nightmares or movies. Accompanied by this wet popping noise, it began to stand up on two legs, like a flipping werewolf. And once it was standing up fully erect, this thing was at least eight feet tall. This thing turned in the direction of their vehicle once again, scowled a final time, and just vanished back into the wood line. Kit was a ranger for at least two years and had never seen anything like that before or since. Her friend and her, who work still in Yosemite Park, do not talk about it much, but they're afraid that people, like many other rangers who are afraid to come forward, would think that they're crazy. But Kit stands by knowing what she saw and that it is not something you would normally see obviously. However, due to her background, her father being white and European, I believe fully Germanic is what she had said, and her mother is a mix of several different tribes, she actually grew up with a lot of native lore and legends, so she's well aware these creatures exist, at least now she is, but before, she entertained the idea but never fully believed it until this night. In 1992, Anders Grant would experience what many would describe as a psychological supernatural nightmare in the Wasatch National Forest, tucked in to the Uinta Mountains east of Salt Lake City. An experience dealing with the death of a close friend, an eerie presence and no way to explain the events of this day. The story I'm about to tell you has left this man traumatized with virtually no explanation for what happened. The events that occurred around Andrew's story happened at Bridger Lake National Forest Campground. This is located in the Wasatch National Forest, which is in the Uinta Mountains. This is a huge national park just east of Salt Lake City. The campground is right on the border to Wyoming, and it's actually substantially deep in the Wasatch Mountains. And the way you get to it is by driving up Highway 80, going past Evanston. The drive is phenomenally beautiful, and when you enter Wasatch Mountains, it's almost life-altering. If you look on the map, you think this is a hell of a long trip just to make it worth it to go camping, but Anders was all in. It was completely worth it. Anders had been there several times before, but doesn't ever recall seeing any warning signs about black bears and is generally considered a safe place to go and be right in the heart of nature without fear of any fierce wild animals. The park is different now. Now, you pay a fee and it's full of tourists and yuppies and their big $50,000 RVs. Rangers give out tickets and back in the 90s, it was still relatively unspoiled and wild. No rangers about it. Only a couple of park picnic benches to sit at and eat. Hardly any sign of mankind anywhere. It's amazing how much development happens within 20 to 30 years. It was also rare to see anybody else unless you went right at the peak of summer. Sure, you'd see a few backpackers and stragglers here and there, but they were far and few in between. 
So here is the story. Anders had this girl from high school who he had went to Weber High School up in North Ogden back in the late 80s. And when Anders was around 23, he was working in Salt Lake. He had ran into her again by pure chance and they had resumed a friendship. Her name was Pamela. She had a new best friend and she had met at work. And this best friend had a brother, Simon, who apparently was gay. So Pamela was now into experimenting with psychedelics like acid and shrooms, and she had kind of become a bit of a hippie. Anders had tried smoking weed, but had never taken mushrooms or really any psychedelics. And so she had met this guy who had become her occasional pot dealer. And back in those days, it was really hard to get mushrooms in Utah. Apparently, they came about once in a blue moon. The Grateful Dead and other counterculture bands and groups of individuals were still touring and you generally had to have some sort of hippie concert connection to get them, much like acid. Too much trouble to pursue this stuff, so this dealer, who Anders had never met prior to this, called Pamela up and said he just got a thousand dollars worth of the best mushrooms he'd ever taken in his life. He had this great big bag full of them. So one thing led to another and Anders and Pamela and this entire group decided to go camping and take a bunch of mushrooms. Sounds fun, right? Well, not quite. No one can think of a better place to do it than the Wasatch Mountains. I mean, you're away from all forms of authority and for the most part, safe to go tripping in the woods. But still, Anders had never met this guy and suggested that perhaps they don't take him after all, none of them really know him and Anders was nervous at the thought. He is after all a dealer, so who knows what he could be bringing with him. But Pamela ensured him not to worry, that he's okay, so fair enough. Anders breathed a sigh of relief and just accepted it as is. Pamela borrowed her brother's Jeep Cherokee because sometimes the roads into the camp can be kind of rough. So she picks Anders up and one after the other, the entire party all pile into the Jeep and finally pick up the dealer guy. Everybody's all anxious to see this big bag of shrooms. However, this dealer guy only has enough for three people because he did not know that Anders and Simon were going to be coming, so he kind of grumbles and goes back into his house and gets some more. He seems okay with it, so nobody was really too worried. Everybody eventually stopped and picked up about $40 worth of provisions. Now Anders was getting excited as was everybody else. This was shaping up to be a very fun adventure ahead. And at this point, it's about 100 miles to Fort Bridger, which they did in under two hours. Then it was about another hour to the campsite. However, during this trip, this guy, the dealer, starts to really rub Anders the wrong way. He immediately somehow picks up on the fact that Simon is gay, or at least he thinks he is, and he has this weird way of saying really offensive, demeaning things to him, trying to provoke a response. As though he's supposed to be funny, but no one thinks he is, it gets old really fast and really kind of ruined the mood for Anders and crew. By the time they had finally reached the campground, Anders was already completely fed up with the guy and realized that perhaps his intuition was right, that they should have just bought the shrooms and left him behind. But Anders thinks now, looking back at things, that his old girlfriend was just looking to save money. He's really not sure what she was thinking. The dealer had told her that he has lots of shrooms and let's go camping and she had just said yes without even considering everything. In hindsight, Anders is pretty sure that this dealer guy was just trying to get into Pamela's pants, but that's beside the point. So they finally get to the camping spot, they get the tent set up and a fire prepared for later that night, and other stuff. They had made ice drinks, it was a very hot and sunny day, and it was now roughly around 1 or 2 p.m. And so they're all getting settled in for the most part, so Anders suggests that they all do the mushrooms right then and there, so that way in a short while, while it's still warm, they can go on a hike. Everybody seemed to agree and like the idea, so everybody took a large helping of shrooms. And Anders remembers they didn't taste bad at all, and he always thought they were supposed to make you puke, but they tasted more earthy and very reasonable. And sure enough, 40 minutes later, and they began to trip a little. This guy, the dealer, had brought a big old bottle of cheap whiskey and he starts down on the whiskey with cans of soda that he purchased, and he offers it to Anders and the rest of the crew, but nobody else really wants a drink. And then he begins to get angry and mean and just a nasty drunk, and everything starts to take a dark turn. 
this dealer guy starts to become verbally abusive and calling Simon these obscene, disgusting names. At this time, Anders didn't know Simon very well, but he knew that he was a really nice, introverted, quiet kid. Not somebody who would cause anyone trouble, but the poor kid could not stand up for himself either. He was fairly shy and didn't talk much. As a matter of fact, Anders isn't even entirely sure he was even gay. He might have just been very shy and awkward. He's not sure. Now, as things begin to heat up in the camp, arguments begin to fly back and forth when Simon's sister was now getting really pissed off. And here they all are, beginning to trip and everything was feeling horrible. And the more Simon's sister stood up for her brother, the more it encouraged this guy. He was saying things like, you can't stand up for yourself. And Anders got into it saying, why are you badgering him? I mean, this guy was saying some really horrible things to Simon. He seemed to be more interested in getting drunk though. So commotion was happening and everybody was getting very upset and arguing and the mood was just really souring. And so finally, Simon had had enough. He gets up and storms off going towards the lake. So with Simon gone, this guy begins to simmer down. But his sister just continually lectures him and apparently succeeds in giving this guy a real sense of shame and guilt. No one says anything for ages and it turns into a real bummer trip. So they go all about their business and they start to talk about stuff and everything becomes okay again for a time. And then a long amount of time had passed and someone finally says, hey, how long has Simon been gone for? And none of them were sure. A long time it had been, hours at this point. This guy, this dealer drunk jerk now, apparently begins to feel a bit of guilt and shame for the harm he caused and eventually volunteered to go find Simon. And he just says, don't worry, I'll go find him. And Anders adds in saying, I'll go with you. And they both agree. And somehow this dealer guy seemed like he had changed now. So Anders felt optimistic that the rest of the day would be at least tolerable, if not good. And he got the feeling that the guy was just upset because Pamela had refused him sexually and was just taking it out on Simon because his ego was bruised and Simon was an easy target. And as they're walking together and chatting, and he's getting to talk to this guy more now, he didn't really seem like such a bad guy. So Anders and Dealer finally reach a spot where they can begin to walk down towards the lake. And there were lots of thin, tall trees and everything is open and it's an easy view. It's beautiful, almost surreal. It's definitely God's country. It's majestic. And so they start yelling out, Simon, Simon. But there's no response. There is a split in the trail in which one goes to one spot by the lake and the other takes you to another spot. Most likely deer trails. They veer away from each other. You can take your pick. So Anders and friend each take a trail and Anders says, if you don't find him, I'll meet you back here in five minutes. Both agree and they go off in their separate directions. Now at this point, Anders is walking for ages, just yelling, Simon, but nothing. And now he's contemplating regretting the entire trip and tripping. He was not having a great time. It was okay, but nothing great. And he had wished now he had stayed home. It was at this point he had tried to shake off the trip, which was now just growing more and more intense as the psilocybin began to kick in more. And then suddenly, Anders gets this overwhelming feeling of fear. It just swept right over him. This terrifying feeling of something telling him he should not take one more step forward. And so Anders stops there and stands. And he's not sure what it is, but suddenly he's terrified to take one more step forward. And while he is afraid, he's now confused. It feels like something is watching him. He's tempted to yell out, Simon, but he stops himself. He immediately turns around to go back up the trail. Going back in the direction he had come from, he sees that the nice sunny weather has now begun to change and he can see some dark clouds forming. There was now a sudden chill and some wind. It's not uncommon for the weather to change instantaneously in the mountains after all. And suddenly, he hears this incredibly loud siren-like noise, kind of like an electromechanical sound, like a machine or something. A high whining industrial manufacturing alarm sound and it was very intense and very loud and seemingly close by. It shocked and scared Anders. It was a sound like something being projected through a giant steel horn loudspeaker. Completely unnatural, considering they're miles from any civilization. Now, Anders begins to hurry, but basically going towards the sound. He didn't know what to make of it. And he runs right into the shroom guy and watches him scurrying up the trail towards him in a panicked frenzy. 
It was really slippery with lots of little round smooth rocks, and the dealer guy kept stumbling and falling as he madly made his way up towards Anders. It's like he had seen a ghost or something. Now this dude, the dealer guy, was tripping out. He could just feel that something was horribly wrong now. This dealer guy gets up to Anders, and so Anders asks him, did you hear that sound? And he just replies, what sound? But then immediately follows up with saying, there is something wrong with that kid. And now he's clinging on to Anders' shirt like a scared child. He's totally different now. Anders could barely even recognize him. And Anders is trying to pursue him, but he could not get any more information out of him, no matter how hard he pried. And eventually, Anders said, let's go. And so the two begin to walk for a minute until they run into Simon. And here's the thing. Simon, he's right at the edge of the lake on his knees. It's like he's frozen solid with his hands by his side. And the weirdest part is he's staring up at the sky and covered in what looked like from head to toe, white ash all over his body, every inch, including his hair and his face and clothes, just covered. It looked like the grayish white cement mixture that Anders had used in the past or a cement mixture that most of us are probably familiar with. You know, the ultra fine kind that gets on everything, but there was none on the ground or anywhere around him. Anders and the dealer guy both run up to him and he has his eyes closed, just staring up with his mouth wide open as though he's silently screaming at the sky. Anders grabs his shoulder and is yelling at him to see if he's okay. And Simon just collapses to the ground and he tells the dealer guy, go get the girls now. And so this guy gets up, he runs off and goes to get them. In the meantime, Anders is trying everything he can to get a response out of Simon. And then he hears the siren again, but this time it's even closer to Anders. It's literally right behind him. And now at this point, Anders is freaking out. He cannot see anything through the trees. He's telling Simon, get up, buddy. Come on, get up. We got to go now. And he is really starting to panic. But Simon proved to be unresponsive. Anders tries to pick him up, but he's too heavy. He tries to get his arm around his waist to gain some leverage and get him on his feet, but no luck. It's like he's just been switched off. No noises, no sound of breathing. Now, Anders was truly panicking. Now, a few minutes go by, and the dealer guy, along with the two girls, Pamela and Simon's sister, come running up, and Simon's sister just begins freaking out. She is hysterical. They didn't know this at the time, but something really bad had happened to Simon. Again, Anders and everybody at this point hears the siren around them, except the dealer guy. And Pamela looks at Anders horrified and says, what was that? And Anders tells her, I don't know, help me get Simon up now. In the meantime, the dealer guy did not seem to hear the siren and Anders isn't sure if he's just so overwhelmed or what, but he has this weird, stunned, disconnected look to his face. He starts to ramble incoherently about them. And he points over to some place by the trees and said, there, he says, they stuck him. Anders didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Anders thought there might have been some redneck teenagers up here camping, causing trouble. I mean, he could not decipher what this dude was talking about or what to think. So just trying to push through everything, they somehow eventually got Simon back to camp and placed him onto a picnic bench. It was unbelievably difficult to move him. At first, he was really stiff and awkward, and then he was like a big rag doll, all heavy and awkward and floppy and hard to hold on to. His sister was screaming the entire time and crying and yelling, what did you do to him? And Anders is yelling back to her, I didn't do nothing. The other guy just was basically checked out, non-responsive in a vegetative state. Anders says he did not recognize his old girlfriend, Pamela, either. Even her hair looked different, a different color and length, and her clothes looked different. Her clothes looked strangely old-fashioned as though from another era. And here is Simon, pure grayish white, covered in this mysterious, ultra-fine powder. The stuff didn't come off on them either. None of them. Nobody knew what this stuff was. Never have any of them been so freaked out in their entire life. Little did any of them realize, a heavy storm was now sweeping over the area, and the sky was now black with clouds, and it was beginning to rain and pour down heavily. In their panic to get out of there, they left almost everything behind. They got out of the main park area and at the bottom near the main road were these giant bins that the park has and there's signs which encourages everybody to remove their own trash and dump it at this point. The dealer guy points at the bins and begins to open the door to get out. 
and Pamela has to literally hit the brakes to stop to keep him from hurting himself because he's trying to get out and he stumbles over the bins, tossing what's left of his shrooms into it. Then he gets back in and just stares forward, completely blank, still in this dead vegetative state. And they drive and they drive and they drive until they reach the tiny little town area of Fort Bridger, which Anders doesn't even think at the time had a police department. It's a genuine one horse town. The whole time they're screaming and carrying on at each other, going into complete hysterics. Simon was now becoming less gray and more luminescent white, almost glowing. Anders could barely even look at him without freaking out. The guy who supplied the mushrooms was just zoned out as if the lights were on, but nobody was home. Anders thinks this guy saw something by the lake, but it was just so terrifying that the dealer guy just shut down mentally and it just clicked off. Now, they called 911 on a payphone and there was no one about in this small town. The guy who had the shrooms snuck off and disappeared during the chaos, never to be seen again. And Anders watched him slink off, but didn't say anything. Anders wasn't even sure that this guy knew where he was going. Anders is pretty sure this guy was just tripping out or gone mentally and just decided to leave. So he has no idea where he went. Now, the police finally arrived with an ambulance an hour later, and it was then that Simon was pronounced dead at the scene. His sister basically lost her mind that day. When they removed him from the back of the Jeep, he now looked perfectly normal. No white gray powder, nothing out of the norm. They were just all rambling maniacs. And later on, the police found the mushrooms in the bin. Anders and Simon's sister did not get into any trouble, but his old girlfriend Pamela was convicted of distributing Class A drugs and given a five-year probation. She's lucky she didn't do any time in prison. However, this mysterious experience had completely wrecked their heads. Some weird stuff had come about afterwards. See, here's where it gets even more wild. None of their own experiences seem to match each other's. Simon's sister insists that it was only the four of them that went camping and there was no other drug dealer guy. Nobody was rude to Simon and he just liked wandering off by himself at times. However, Anders and his old girlfriend Pamela clearly recalled the guy and talked about his bad behavior. The police never found this guy or could confirm his existence. There were no phone records and Simon's sister had no recollection of getting angry or arguing with anyone that day. The police simply didn't know what to think. Pamela said that while they were looking away, looking for Simon, a group of Native Americans had wandered through the camp dressed in very poor, tatty old tribal clothing. They looked really intense. They walked right past them without a few feet, but didn't even look in their direction or make any sound. However, the Wind River Reservation is 150 miles north and is occupied primarily by the Shoshone and the Arapaho Indians. The police took Pamela back up the mountain later that day and she showed them where the guy dumped the mushrooms. Simon's sister would later insist that it was her who got out of the Jeep and deposited them in the bin and that it was her who brought the mushrooms. She insisted that these friends never ever picked up any dealer. Andrews could not even remember where the guy lived because he had never been to that part of South Salt Lake, which is huge and goes on for miles. It was a totally insane experience and he could only assume that Pamela took them to her house, but obviously did not turn up anything useful. Anders wasn't tripping so bad that he had elucidated all this stuff. He still had his own head about him. He still was present and grounded enough in reality that he knew what was real and what was not. However, he has had no explanation for any of this. Later on, he had heard that Simon died officially of unknown reasons. He basically just stopped living with no definable explanation and no drugs were found in his system, although they all remembered taking mushrooms. And his sister even insisted that he had never used any mushrooms that day or any other day previous. No one recovered any gray dust or powder on him. And Simon's sister said that she saw a very tall old man dressed in dark clothing walking near the edge of the woods. When she had made eye contact, he paused and waved to her before disappearing over the ridge. Anders never saw anybody else there that day, and Pamela never told Anders she had saw the old man either. So he wants to know, what was all of this? Was it just kids using shrooms and getting a mental wrecking from their youthful folly? An experience with aliens, perhaps? Or were they violating the sacred burial spots of Native American Indians? And if so, why would they want to harm a good soul like Simon? And what was that horrible siren in a place utterly devoid of human civilization? 
None of it makes much sense. Could it have been evil spirits or a witch in the mountain? Shadow people or something supernatural and sinister? Did a parallel universe open and allow through some malicious beings through before retreating back to where they came? It is these events that have haunted him ever since 1992 on that horrible day. If, if there is a cave hiding a dragon by Yellowstone Lake, one can reasonably see how such a feature might go unnoticed. Yellowstone Lake is the largest body of water in the park with 110 miles of shoreline. Beyond the shore, however, a handful of islands pop up above the waves. One of the more significant sites is Stevenson Island, which stretches about 820 feet wide and is just over a mile long. The island was named in honor of Colonel James D. Stevenson, an executive officer with the U.S. Geological Survey who helped explore Yellowstone National Park in 1871. You see, it was during this period that settlers first reached the shore of what would later become known as Stevenson Island, and eventually, a 60,500 passenger steamboat christened the E.C. Waters began offering tours of Yellowstone Lake in 1905. It promised to be a lucrative plan. Unfortunately, this opportunity was doomed from the start. The steamboat's owner and Yellowstone National Park authorities constantly butted heads after customers began complaining about his attitude and his treatment of the wildlife. He was denied a license to operate the E.C. Waters as a passenger ferry. So, his only choice was to then leave it docked at the Stevenson Island until the matter could be further settled. To make matters worse, the ice that forms over a majority of Yellowstone Lake in the winter months meant that the boat could only reliably operate from June to November. But in 1906, the owner of the E.C. Waters hired a caretaker to watch his investment during the off-season, a duty which included occasional checkups on the vessel moored at Stevenson Island. The caretaker set off in his rowboat towards Stevenson Island one winter day, but the effort proved too much. Rowing was difficult enough on its own, but the strain of breaking the ice to reach the island gave the caretaker a heart attack, and he died on the way. No one was able to maintain the easy waters, and over the remaining months, the steamboat fell into disrepair. The owner left it moored at Stevenson Island, where it simply just rotted away. The wreck was pushed ashore in 1921 and picked over in the coming years. The boiler was removed to heat a hotel, its hull used as a makeshift shelter for skiers, and later as an awning for a fish fry business that operated during the warmer months. It also began hosting late night parties and the fights which would inevitably break out. In fact, one such brawl took place in the summer of 1929. A park ranger had his easygoing morning shift interrupted by his supervisor who had asked him to check on the welfare of a group of drinkers who had set up on Stevenson Island the night before. There had been reports of fighting and the supervisor wanted to make sure that nobody was stranded or, even worse, lay out bleeding in the shadow of the wrecked steamboat. The morning was warm and pleasant, and the ranger happily hustled down to the marina to procure one of the official boats used to patrol Yellowstone Lake. The trip to Stevenson Island from the shore was a brief one during the summer months, so the ranger arrived at the shoreline in short order. Now, immediately, the ranger could see the telltale signs of partiers. Trash was strewn everywhere on shore, including empty beer bottles, some of which bobbed lazily in the water, and the wake from the ranger's boat set the glass containers into a frenzy as he pulled it up to the steamboat's creaking remains and disembarked. He had a lot of work ahead of him so he began grabbing as much trash as possible. Now, once this task was complete, the ranger peered into the wreck of the E.C. waters. Luckily, no one seemed to have been left behind from the previous night's party. However, it was entirely possible that some inebriated partygoers had wandered down the shore. The ranger was forced to check the entirety of Stevenson Island, which, while not huge, would still require a bit of effort. The ranger's cheerful mood had dissipated by mid-morning, his search failed to turn up any stragglers, and the only thing he had to show for it was sweat, exhaustion, and a grumpy disposition. Satisfied at the thoroughness of his search, the ranger set back toward the beach where his patrol boat waited. As he reached the top of a small rise, however, a wind gust of staggering strength nearly threatened to knock the ranger off his feet. The air was turned cold, almost freezing, and the once placid waters of Yellowstone Lake had become a rolling boil of white caps. Now here's where things get crazy. This massive, dark thunderhead pressed forward in the sky towards Stevenson Island. 
And that was when the ranger spotted something floating in the shallows, something he had never noticed on his search. It was the shape of a person, big and bulky. The ranger's heart leapt into his throat, realizing there had indeed been someone injured the night before, and the time was of the essence. He fumbled with his radio, prepared to tell the rescue team that a partygoer had fallen from the steamboat wreckage into the water, hitting their head on the way down, potentially drowning. The only sound that greeted the ranger's frantic call was the blank hiss of static. He knew he had to do something, so he wades into the shallow water where the body floated face down. As he dropped to his knees, the ranger noticed that the clothing on the body didn't seem modern at all. Instead, he was looking at a man who would have been right at home in the days before Yellowstone became a national park. He was dressed like a quintessential explorer or fur trapper. Was this a ghost? Surely not. The ranger was actually able to reach out and check the man for a pulse. He was dead. The ranger flipped the corpse onto its back, facing the sky. The sight was grotesque. Bulging brown eyes goggled at him from a ghastly blue-white face of a drowning victim. And then, so quickly, the ranger said it took place in between one breath and the next. The body was simply gone. The ranger's hands, which had been moments before held the thick furs of an old-fashioned jacket, now grasped empty air. Bewildered, he staggers backwards onto the shore and falls on the sand, staring at the vacant spot. He's trying to gather his thoughts, and the ranger noted that the scene around him had also changed as well. Gone was the thundercloud, as was the wind, leaving Yellowstone Lake peaceful once again. He no longer felt cold, but instead the refreshing warmth of the sun caressed his face. Had the body somehow drifted away suddenly? The ranger scoured the waters beyond Stevenson Island, but nothing seemed out of place like before. Now, fighting off a panic attack, he tried to take stock of what had only happened, but the only thing that could explain the entire ordeal were that he had encountered a ghost, or, or that he had somehow miraculously slipped back in time for a brief moment to the immediate aftermath of an undocumented tragedy. The ranger rushed to his boat, hopped in, making a direct line back to the mainland. Now, the following year, the Park Service decided to put an end to the late-night drinking parties on Stevenson Island. They were done. They soaked the wreck of the EC waters in kerosene, leaving behind a charred hole clinging to the barest metal framework. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is a national park in the United States. Kilauea, one of the world's most active volcanoes, and Mauna Loa, the world's most enormous shield volcano, are both parts of the park. The scientists can learn about the evolution of the Hawaiian Islands and conduct research at the park. For visitors, the park offers extraordinary volcanic environments, glimpses of rare flora and fauna, and a view into the traditional Hawaiian culture linked to these scenes. Established on August 1st, 1916, Hawaii National Park was eventually divided into this park and Haleakala National Park. In acknowledgement of its exceptional natural standards, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park was allocated as an International Biosphere Reserve in 1980 and a World Heritage Site in 1987. This national park is known for not just its beauty, but also an area of superstition and mystery. You see, on March 27th, 1998, a blue eruption of light ignited the night sky along with a huge thunderous roar. Hundreds of locals called to report the event as did a pilot who was in flight at the time. The pilot alleged that the fireball came within two miles of this aircraft and he observed a dramatic increase in the temperature in the area. The pilot's testimony was endorsed by others in the place with him and officials afterward declared that the blast was nothing more than a meteor. However, that doesn't sit right. Some Hawaiian locals were not convinced. They claimed that the blast observed by so many was surely a sign of an Hawaiian god who had been awakened now and who was now enraged with what humankind was doing to the world. In fact, a Newswatch bulletin taken from that day reads this, a brilliant light gives night owls a rare treat. Islanders who happen to be up at 2.41 a.m. today were treated to a spectacular light show in the sky. I wish I'd seen it, said Bishop Museum Planetarium Manager Peter McCod, who was asleep and missed it. It was probably a once-in-a-lifetime to see. But what exactly was it? From talking to people who saw it and called the planetarium, McCod said it sounds like the light might have been a, a fireball or maybe a bright meteor. On the other hand, it could have been a piece of space junk, he said. A piece of satellite or discarded rocket element 
it's hard to tell. In fact, it was so bright and people did see different colors too. Sometimes that's indicative of space junk because of the different metals used in spacecraft. Now, police dispatchers on Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island, and the planetarium security guards and radio stations all received a ton of calls about the mysterious light. On Oahu, callers described it as a bluish purple. On the Big Island, where the calls came in the most from all districts, police said the light made the night sky as bright as day. The Coast Guard even said it appeared to be a large meteor traveling through the sky. And while sporadic meteors, remnants of the solar system are common, but to have one happen overhead when you happen to be looking up is pretty rare for an average individual. This is one of many odd events that have occurred on the island of Hawaii, because various tourists have removed rocks from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and then sent them back. They sent them back claiming that the unusual incidents had taken place when they arrived home with the rocks. Many believe that they had been cursed for stealing the rocks from their home. Others have stated that they had too been confronted by spirits while exploring the island late at night as well as seeing a mysterious mist in the distance story was submitted to me by an anonymous hiker who with his girlfriend back years ago went hiking up in Yosemite Falls. They had never really been a believer in the paranormal or Sasquatch they write or anything like that until this had happened. And he declares that it's really opened his eyes. He wrote that he's 24 years old and was raised in a very strict Catholic household and always a firm believer in the church and always has very high moral values. So no drugs, no alcohol, a very straight edge kid growing up and he vouches for honesty. So he went on to explain to me exactly what happened and how it happened. The day started off as normal as he described going on a hike with his girlfriend in Yosemite Falls and he's hiked there many times before, so he felt confident in knowing the area well. Now this event occurred in the Upper Falls Trail near where Snow Creek intersects. It was a clear day, not too hot, and the sun was out. It wasn't raining or anything like that, or had rained. There was nobody else on the trail with them or around them during this time. It was roughly around 4, 4.30 p.m., and as they're coming down this part in the path that he described dips down by maybe five or so feet, him and his girlfriend hear this ear-shattering scream from no more than 100 feet away to their left. He described it as this deep, guttural roar, like you're hearing it from inside someone's chest. It was so loud and piercing that his girlfriend dropped her water bottle so shaken and it rattled their chest. It startled both of them and they quickly looked to see what it was and standing off in the distance as the land kind of dips down a bit, behind a tree or next to a tree. They're both shocked to see this large man-like figure standing there, but it's completely black. The anonymous hiker went on to describe that he's about 6'1", and his girlfriend's about 5'5", but he could already tell that this thing, they're at a huge disadvantage. I mean, this thing's easily eight feet tall, if not larger. I mean, it's humongous. Imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger and make him three feet taller and make him more broad, and you'd be right around the same ballpark. From what him and his girlfriend can tell, this person was dressed in full fur or thick bear-like fur, no clothing on whatsoever. And from the angle and lighting, the fur appeared to be a reddish brown. It was matted and kind of nasty looking, not groomed at all, very unkempt. But yet you could still see from the distance they were at that it was very muscular. Huge chest, huge pectoral muscles, large biceps, large shoulders, and its arms were very long, reminiscent of an ape, and that the head was massive and cone-shaped, and it did not see any neck. It was just kind of like this. He went on to describe that they really couldn't see the face very well because of where the sun was positioned in the sky in correlation to where this thing was standing. Now, as soon as both this hiker and his girlfriend saw it, immediately they were frightened after it screamed, and they went off down the trail the other way. He's not exactly sure what he did or what his girlfriend did to prompt this thing to scream at them, but knows deep down that this was most likely a Sasquatch of some kind, possibly territorial or aggressive, and that for whatever reason, it did not like that they were there and maybe decided to reveal itself because they were the only ones in the visible area at the time. But whatever the case may be about this situation, it had convinced the submitter of the story that now Bigfoot or Sasquatch, whatever you call him, are now real and can be terrifying when threatened. Was it a flu that wiped out the Nahani or a curse? Explorers found that anyone overnighting in the ruins of Nahani settlements contracted a highly infectious, mysterious illness themselves. In Diné legend, this might have been attributed to the Soneteye, 
the most feared of all great spirits who inflicted disease with the help of demons who called the Nahani Valley their home. The Tsoneteye is far from the only dangerous entity found here. In indigenous belief, the entire area is haunted. While some spirits were helpful, a great number were dangerous. Lesser powers inhabited every animal, plant, rock, and landmark of the valley and were capable of inflicting great harm on anyone disturbing their environment. Countless Dene hunters walked into Nahani never to return, victims of the land's bad medicine. Others found that the trails of the animals they tracked simply ended as if their quarry vanished into thin air or were swallowed by the earth itself. Today, many still believe that these spirits and the curses they created cling to the Nahani Valley, the source of its many deaths and disappearances. One notable spirit dwells in the caves along the South Nahani River. According to tribal lore, it is known for making people disappear like smoke in the wind. Its hideous wails can be heard drifting on the breeze at night. While on an expedition to Nahani, journalist Pierre Breton experienced this sound firsthand. He described a low howling whine that swept out of the mountain down into the valley, died, and rose again in greater intensity. The banshee wail made our hackles rise, for this was, without a doubt, the spirit sound so many men talked and whispered about. Even when this sound isn't heard, an oppressive feeling hovers over Nahani. Frank Henderson said in the 1940s that there is absolutely no denying the sinister atmosphere of the whole valley. Depending on the legend, the park's eerie landmarks, including its many caves and thin spires of rock called hoodoos, either housed, attracted, or were created by these spirits themselves. These spirits sometimes make themselves explicitly known. In July of 2010, Anthony Roche, a Parks Canada employee of indigenous descent, was preparing for winter in Nahani by clearing trails and collecting firewood for the warden's cabin. Although no tourists were allowed in this portion of the park at the time, due to the forest fires, he found companionship in two other employees, Bob and Amy, who eventually joined him at the cabin. One day, Anthony and Bob dozed off in their bunk beds while Amy washed dishes in the kitchen. After a time, Anthony heard her stop. Everything fell silent in the cabin, and a short time later, Anthony became aware of someone, presumably Amy, walking from the kitchen into the bunk room. The presence tapped him on his heel. Anthony grumbled a reply, assuming Amy wanted him to finish the dishes. He dozed off, only to be briefly awoken again by a light shake on the shoulder. Finally, the footsteps angrily stomped back into the bunk room, and Anthony was forcefully shaken awake. The footsteps stormed out of the room before he opened his eyes, and when he looked, there was nobody there. After using the outhouse, Anthony returned to the cabin, only to find Amy herself asleep on the couch. When he woke her up, she denied ever entering the bunk room. Bob said that he had been asleep the entire time as well. Even if he was lying, Bob had been on the top bunk, and there was no way he could have climbed down without Anthony noticing. A month later, Anthony was helping a student and other co-workers film a promotional video for Nahani. At one point, they were alarmed by a strange call from the forest. It sounded like a raven, but was clearly a human being imitating a raven. Tourists were still restricted in the area, and Anthony looked to one of the senior park employees for an answer. His companion only cryptically replied, he's just letting us know he's there. Within moments, the wind picked up, carrying the unmistakable sound of a woman singing. This time, none of Anthony's co-workers could offer any explanation, other than that they all agreed it sounded exactly like singing. In fact, Timothy John Barnes, who's only 25 years old, is a lot like Joel Thomasin in the sense where he just disappeared. Timothy John Barnes had been a resident of Cucamonga, California in 1988. Timothy had left Tanaya Lakes right near Highway 120 East to Tioga Road in California. This was approximately at 9 in the morning. On July 5th, 1988, Timothy had this plan to hike from the Murphy Creek Trailhead all the way to Polydome Lakes in Yosemite National Park. The location is approximately 3 miles, give or take, from Tanaya Lakes. But, like many other hikers who promised they'll be back, he never showed up and was never seen from again. Now, if we look specifically at these kinds of disappearances, it's very possible that there is a human trafficking element which I'm 100% sure does happen. But how do you account for the hundreds, if not thousands of people that go reporting under 
strange circumstances like this. I mean, these people don't just disappear, they literally disappear without a trace of anybody ever seeing them again. And if we think critically, to smuggle someone or to kidnap them, you would have to do it very clandestinely without anybody else, including other hikers, campers, or park personnel seeing you at all. And a lot of times, these people go missing off in the middle of nowhere, albeit they're still on a well-known trail, but still, it just seems highly unlikely. Timothy's friends at the time had reported him missing to the park ranger personnel and the search and rescue service and they began an extensive search the following day. But even that failed to produce any evidence to his potential whereabouts. And finally, on July 19th, 1992, he was legally declared dead after years of his disappearance and his remains have never been found. And 30 years later, since his declaration of death, well, almost about 30 years, there has still been no trace of him ever to be found. And his family, like many other of the missing persons, will never have that closure at least for the time being. The first strange thing that really stood out to me is the tree that is known as the old man. This is probably the best documented thing that can suggest that. Just maybe there is something truly strange going on in Crater Lake. The old man is a 30 foot hemlock tree that floats upright in Crater Lake with about three feet showing above the surface. Carbon dating estimates the tree to be over 450 years old, and it was first sighted in 1896 by a geologist, Joseph Diller. Many things about this tree are strange and odd, to say the least. The first fact is that the tree looks like it is rooted into the lake bed below. However, it moves across the lake. In 1938, a group was commissioned to see just how far this tree moves. It was determined that from the month of July to the month of October that this tree had moved around the lake some 62.7 miles. In fact, on August 6th, it was recorded as moving a whopping 3.8 miles. Some people have argued that the wind is blowing the tree around the lake. It has been observed that the old man often goes in the direction against the wind. Another thing that has stumped scientists is the fact that this tree has been floating for so long. I couldn't find a definitive answer on how long the process usually takes, but normally what happens is that a tree floating in a body of water will become waterlogged and ultimately will sink over time. The process is usually a lot quicker than 120 years, and for all we know, the old man could have been in the lake longer than that. And yet, another strange thing about the old man is the way it is floating. It is floating in an upright position. Scientists have measured the tree, and according to their calculations, a tree the size of the old man should be floating horizontal, not vertical. This has caused scientists to try and develop a hypothesis to explain the abnormal behavior. One theory is that the rocks were attached to the tree's roots when it fell into the lake and thus has caused the tree to anchor into an upright position. However, there's no evidence to suggest that this is the case. Because scientists don't have a definitive answer on why the old man floats the way it does, some have begun to suggest that the old man defies known physics. Its origins and floating orientation is not the only weird thing associated with the old man. Some people claim that it has the power to alter the very weather around it. The story has been told hundreds of times and goes like this. In the year 1988, a group of scientists was going to conduct a submarine expedition of the lake itself. They viewed the old man as a safety hazard and decided it would be best to moor it in on the eastern shore of Wizard Island. The story goes that the crew had not so much as put the rope around the log when out of nowhere, the sky turned dark and the lake waters suddenly became violent and a nasty storm began to rage. The crew began to panic and untied the tree. The crazy thing is that as soon as the rope was removed, the skies immediately cleared. The wind stopped and the weather returned to the blissfulness that existed before they had put the rope onto the old man. An interesting note is that, as mentioned earlier in the video, Wizard Island is associated with the Dark Lord Lao. So maybe something is truly going on, whether there be a dark energy trapped on it or something unexplainable, perhaps something supernatural. I tried to see if there was anything conclusive that would point to this really happening, but I couldn't find any firsthand accounts of this. However, I did find that indeed a submarine expedition did take place in 1988 and that several park rangers at Crater Lake believe this to be a true story. 
So much so that they no longer allow people to jump onto the old man and pose for pictures. In fact, one of the more notorious events surrounding the Lake Michigan Triangle is in 1891, a schooner that was named the Thomas Hume had set off across the lake to the other side in search of lumber. And somehow, in the midst of traveling from one shore to the other, the ship had disappeared, along with its crew of seven sailors. And what's strange is today with all of our technology and the fact that we can trace things on the bottom of the lake and find wrecked ships, there is zero trace of the ship ever existing, and they cannot find any wreckage of it on the bottom of the lake. But it doesn't end just there, because in 1921, 11 people inside the Rosa Bell ship had also somehow mysteriously vanished without a trace while in the Lake Michigan Triangle. However, the ship was later found overturned in the water. When they were able to pull the boat ashore and observe it for details or clues to what had happened, the ship appeared to have been in a collision with another ship. However, at the time, there was no other ships that had reported an accident or a collision at all, making many scratch their heads and wondering how and why is this possible? But perhaps one of the more disturbing and strange cases of the Lake Michigan Triangle is that of George R. Donner. Because on April 28th, 1937, Captain Donner had just mysteriously vanished from his ship cabin. The sail was going smooth and everything was normal. The captain alerted his entire crew that he was going to retreat to his quarters to rest. And after doing so, about three or so hours later, one of his crew members went into his cabin to report to him, hey captain, we're nearing the port and he was nowhere to be found. It would have been impossible for him to sneak off the boat since there were crew everywhere and someone surely would have seen him if he had jumped off the boat committing suicide somehow. So where did he go? And more importantly, if he did disappear, why did none of the other crew disappear as well? Of course, at the time, they searched as thoroughly as they could, but to this day, his disappearance remains unsolved. Crater Lake National Park, while stunning, beautiful, and serene, holds its own dark mysteries and past. While, like many other national parks, is the grounds for many missing persons and strange disappearances, but also a lot of homicides. In the summer of 1979, a David Panabaker decided to take a job here as a seasonal park ranger. But Dave's interest peaked as he was told by fellow rangers and park personnel about a craft that had shown up there shortly after World War II, a Grumman F6F Hellcat fighter that had somehow managed to crash land into this section of the park, but was unable to be retrieved and moved out. So there it laid, just sitting out in the wilderness for anyone to go see, if you knew where to go. Even though nature had mostly reclaimed this area where the plane had crashed, part of the White Star insignia could still be made out from the overgrowth surrounding it, and part of its machine gun was now embedded in the side of the cliff. Nobody knew exactly what had happened to the pilot, most assumed he had either perished in the crash or had parachuted his way out and nobody knows what became of him. So in pursuit of wanting to see this plane, Dave Panabaker decided that taking a day off to go and see this plane wreckage would be really cool. So that's exactly what he did. And as he hiked and ventured off into the wilderness, he eventually lost track of where he was trying to find this plane wreckage. And he searched and he searched and he scoured, but eventually he did not find anything. And after some time, he realized that he was lost. And if he did not stop and get his bearings, he soon would become another statistic of a missing persons in the park. So that's when this young seasonal park ranger sat on a log and began to really think about what he was doing, where he could go, and how he can get himself out of this predicament that he had now found himself in. He still had not found the plane wreckage and he needed to get out of here now. When he realized while well, he was in deep in thought, something was looking at him, something that used to be living, because right in front of him, under a log, was the remains of a deceased World War II Hellcat pilot. Of course, all that remained was just a skeleton at this point, but immediately you can imagine the dread and nervousness and fear that Dave must have felt having his eyes fall upon this old cadaver that is years old at this point. David, probably beyond terrified and also intrigued, actually took the skull and was somehow able to find his way back because later on, when he had spoke to his chief ranger, who was not at all happy with him, by the way, since he had lost his way and almost became another missing persons, 
He simply showed his chief ranger the skull and the chief ranger was astonished when David told his story. They had an entire naval investigation team come out using dental records to identify the person of the skull. The skull had belonged to Ensign Frank Lupo of New Jersey. It is said that Lupo had been part of a squadron of seven Hellcats flying from Redmond to Red Bluff, California in 1945. All seven of them had been struggling with visibility in the weather that day since the clouds were much lower than normal which had made visibility a lot more difficult. As the squadron flew in the ever-lowering fog of clouds that actually got at one point only around 500 feet above the treetops, all the Hellcats had emerged safely except for one. They were missing one of their members. Ensign Frank Lupo had somehow probably crashed or something had happened due to complete lack of visibility and the rest is history. And this story actually has a positive end as the Navy was able to return Ensign Skull to Frank's mother. And after 25 years of heartache and heartbreak and lots of questions, she was finally able to have answers and put her son to rest. Jeremy Foyer had worked as a park ranger in the Mount Rainier National Park in and around 2014. He had lived within the confines of the park, but primarily would stay at the Sunrise Visitor Center on the weekends. During the time of this account, it was around 3.30 in the morning, and Jeremy was driving up kind of a more rockier mountainous road in very dense fog. And his headlights were able to cut through just enough to where he could see where he was going. Now this night, there was very little moonlight and much to see around him, so he's going slow, he's clutching the wheel, trying his best to just navigate his way through this road. And like most other accounts, he sees something that terrifies him. As he's coming around a bend in the mountain road, he catches movement off to his right. And at first he thinks it's a person because it wasn't an animal, like how it would be when crouched down on all fours, but more standing up. And as he starts to slow down, he's doing probably roughly about 20, 25 miles an hour. He sees this figure stop and get right about to the edge of the road. And he's coming around this bend at the same time. So just out of the dim lighting, he could see a figure. But as his headlights round the bend and begin to shine and partially illuminate this figure, he immediately notices that this was not a person at all, but rather an animal or creature of some sort. And a bipedal one at that. Now, his description of this creature that he saw was that it was no taller than a man, probably roughly maybe around 5'8 to 5'11, because he's about 5'10 himself and said that it was about his same height, but he said it looked just like a person, just very hairy, and that the head was distinctly that of a German shepherd or similar to a timber wolf, and that as soon as it came to the edge of the road, it stopped turned its head and looked directly into his eyes. And immediately, he comes to a complete stop, his mouth is wide open, and he's staring at this thing in complete disbelief with his brain now trying to process. And judging by its appearance, he could immediately tell this was not some person coming down the mountainside in a werewolf costume. This looked far too real, and he could see the muscles rippling underneath its chest and body and speaking of which, the fur and skin right around the chest and the biceps were very thin, meaning that you could see muscle definition. You could see its chest contract and expand as it took its breath. Even seeing the hot breath in the cold night air and its eyes glowing this amberish yellow color looking right at him. And as he's staring at this thing, his eyes kind of slowly begin to go down and he notices at its sides were human hands, or at least human-like hands, where it had four fingers and an opposable. They just had long three to four inch claws at the end of them, but he said if there was ever a living werewolf that this was it, even though he understands the ridiculous notion claiming that this creature looked similar to a fictitious animal, but that's what it was. Or so he's convinced it was some kind of animal that resembles that. And almost seeming to break his gaze, this thing begins to step forward into his headlights coming directly at his vehicle. Now, as this is happening, he's still locked in shock, mouth open. And Jeremy also looks and notices that unlike a dog, which has hawks, this thing has legs just like a man. Knees bent a very specific way with ankles and large feet. And this thing is just casually strolling through right to his vehicle. At this point, Jeremy doesn't know what to do. Not only is he confused, but now he's incredibly frightened. And immediately he goes to look down and put the car in reverse. And as he goes to do that, he feels something hit the car. And immediately he looks up and sees that this thing has now cleared the short distance in a matter of only seconds and is now putting its hand on the hood of the car 
pressing it down while never ever breaking its gaze into Jeremy's eyes. The way Jeremy interprets this is that it was threatening him or at least trying to be the alpha one, the dominant one, letting Jeremy know, you're in my territory, you better respect it. And as Jeremy took his foot off the brake pedal and slowly on the gas, his car began to drift down. And as he began going in reverse slowly, but also trying to speed up to get away from this thing, it just stood there as its headlights began to pull further and further back with this thing just being completely still before eventually losing all sight of it in the fog as he drove in reverse away. Jeremy at this point begins crying and breaking down because he's terrified, unsure of how to prevail against such a bizarre and terrifying creature. So he's able to regain himself after a couple of moments, realizing that this thing could still be coming toward his vehicle in the fog. And so he decides that he has no other way. He can't just reverse all the way back down this road. He has to put his car in drive and drive a little faster, hoping he won't encounter this thing in which he last saw it standing in the middle of the road right in his way. So he puts the car in drive, braces, and wishes for the best. And he goes a little bit faster this time. And within a couple of hundred yards, he gets to the exact same spot that he had seen this wolf creature at but it's nowhere to be found. And so he's not even bothering to look around or check his surroundings. He just wants to get off this dirt road so he can go home. Fortunately, Jeremy makes it past without any incident, but as he is now past this point, ah, breathing a sigh of relief that it is over, he notices something in his rearview mirror. So he's driving, now hoping he could see the fog clearing up a bit, so he's hoping he can get down to the road. He sees this thing coming out of the fog, running towards his vehicle, but now on all fours. Jeremy, incredibly frightened by what he's now seeing in his rearview mirror, decides to speed up even more. And after a little ways, he's able to get through the fog as it kind of clears up as he's descending in elevation. This chase only lasted for about 45 or so seconds, never fully catching up to his vehicle, but getting very close. And just like that, along with the fog, this thing disappears. And now that he's low enough in elevation, he doesn't see it anymore. Jeremy was fortunate to be able to make it home safely without any other incident or anything following him or any other sightings. Jeremy would move at the end of 2014 to Pennsylvania, where he continued his career as a park ranger in the Forest Service. And since that night, Jeremy Foyer has not had any other encounters like this. This first story is submitted by Dylan. In August of 2011, Dylan was working as a seasonal employee park ranger at the Deep Creek Campground in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It was right around midnight when he had left to drive back to his home on the other side of the park. He had taken this route many times before, and it is usually very dark with only sparse lighting. On this night, however, the moon was out and very full, and so visibility was much better than usual. As he's driving down a road, Deep Creek Road, which takes you south down into Bryson City, something had caught his eye up ahead near some trees on the side of the road by an old picnic table that has since been removed due to age and rot. At first, Dylan thought it might be a bear because there are black bear all over the south, but then he realized how oddly shaped it was compared to that of a normal black bear, especially standing upright, like this one did. What he estimated was a creature that stood about seven to eight feet tall with what appeared to be long flowing black hair covering its entire body except for its face, which appeared more human-like than anything else although it was hard to tell from the angle he was at and the lighting conditions he was in. Its arms were not as large as you would expect from an animal of this size, but instead more thin and lankier with very long bony fingers. Dylan only saw it for about 10 seconds as he continued driving, but that was enough time to give him a very eerie feeling in the pit of his stomach and make him wonder exactly what he had just seen. As soon as he got home, he tells his wife about what had happened and at first, like usual, she seemed very skeptical until he went on to describe exactly what he had seen in more detail. And although she didn't mention Bigfoot or Sasquatch because she doesn't really know much about them, she thought that it was very possible that that's what it could have been. And for a long time, Dylan had a really hard time accepting this and processing this experience until he got to talk to some other persons working in the park about some similar sightings. One of the staff, specifically to whom he became very close with while they worked, detailed several sightings that she had had while working within the park herself. This really opened Dylan's eyes to the fact that this area is probably more active with these kind of creatures more than he had ever imagined. 
He has since then become a believer and is convinced that whatever he saw was most likely a Sasquatch of some kind. Now, the first sighting his coworker had described to him was back in 1997 at the Deep Creek area, where she too saw a large bipedal creature moving across the road in front of her vehicle while she was driving. Since then, she has also had several other sightings within the park and along nearby roads. Both the areas are very close to one another, as well as the sighting location that Dylan had, which makes him feel even more certain that this is a hot spot for these creatures in the area. But the creature he saw, unlike his coworker, was not as big and bulky, and although tall, more thin and slender. The creature in which she had seen, she described it as more apish looking, while the one he had seen, although more slender and tiny, seemed more human in appearance. Both Dylan and his coworker have seen a multitude of black bears in the area many times before. Dylan describes not hearing any sounds as this thing moved across the road in front of him, but also described that the engine kind of drowned out any other noise along with the radio, but said that this putrid odor filled up the cabin of his vehicle. It was a putrid odor of rotting meat and urine, as Dylan described it and similar to his coworker who had had another encounter with one of these things in 2005 when she too was driving down a similar road during the summer and the early evening hours. She saw a large upright creature like the previous creature she had seen and what Dylan had seen upright standing on hind legs next to the road near a tree. She described this one as being around eight feet tall, gray, large head, shoulders, long arms, and virtually no neck. Unlike the first one, she said this one's build was much larger. And while she actually suspects the first creature she saw to be a female, judging by its shape and figure, this one was obviously a male, judging by its muscle definition and its overall shape of body. Unlike the first encounter, this one seemed to act aggressively towards her. And she said that it actually took a few steps toward her car as if it was getting ready to do a bluff charge. She described it as very intense, very frightening, and very aggressive. In the time since then, Dylan had heard of other sightings in and around the area, but couldn't recall any off the top of his head. There is also Native American tribe reservations nearby, not too far, and they've also reported sightings in that area as well, and each tribe has many stories of their own. In fact, they might be the best persons to go to for stories just like this one. So what do you think? Did Dylan and his coworker truly see something out of this world, or... Is this simply three misidentifications of a black bear? I'll let you decide. What would have happened if this singing spirit had approached the park employees? They might have gone mad. Numerous tales of individuals emerging insane from the Nahani Valley stretch back into indigenous lore, with more modern accounts verified in the historical record. For example, bush pilots checking on the well-being of five prospectors in 1960 were met with a grisly scene. From the two survivors, they pieced together the details. The prospector's flower supply had begun to run low, and judging from the moose and caribou carcasses present, they had turned to hunting big game in the park. None of them had dressed the animals, however, and simply left them in the field. Instead, the men butchered and ate their own dogs, sometimes waiting until they were so rotten that their skin sloughed off at the slightest touch. Another prospector consumed the guts of a caribou but left all the actual meat to rot in the sun. In their desperation and madness, one of the men killed himself with the last of their dynamite far off in the forest. When they learned of this tragedy, two prospectors set off for help but never returned, leaving the final two survivors to languish deliriously in their cabin. Another unfortunate victim of Nahani's madness was a prospector named Joe, who set up a simple log cabin in Nahani around 1914, when a rescue party looking for a missing person in the valley stumbled upon him, and they found his face severely scratched, an eye swollen shut. They asked Joe if he and his prospecting partner Red had been fighting. Joe mumbled something about being abandoned and fighting blue devils in the mountains that he now had imprisoned in a box. Joe rushed back to his cabin, fetching a small wooden container and instructed the rescuers to follow him into the wilderness. They reluctantly obliged, but after a time began to suspect that the box was full of gunpowder. The other men tackled Joe. To their relief, they found that the box only included matches and baking powder. After a brief struggle, realization washed over Joe's face. 
and he finally recognized his visitors, having met them before. They brought him back to the cabin where they hid his cutlery and bandaged his wounds, supposedly obtained in a fall. A short time thereafter, they found Red, who had fled into the wilderness to escape Joe's madness. In the coming weeks, Joe seemed to calm down and the pair resumed their prospecting. However, he eventually started inventing bizarre rituals and culminating in the construction of a sacrificial altar on a mountaintop. This was the final straw. Red took Joe back to civilization for medical treatment. 51-year-old Michael Vickery was reported missing when he did not return from a four-day hike. Of course, this was back on June 15, 2005. Michael was already known as an experienced hiker, an avid outdoorsman, a backpacker, you know the type. And he had visited the north side of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir in Yosemite National Park because he had plans for a solo hike, a very in-depth solo hike, mind you. He had planned to take this extensive hike to Ranchera Falls, to Tiltil Mountain, to Lake Vernon, and then through Beehive before returning back to the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. The last anybody ever saw of Michael is when he began walking north to the Pacific Crest Trail towards the direction of Tiltil Mountain. After that, nobody heard from him again. It's just as if he had mysteriously vanished like all the others we've spoken about today. His family had become gravely concerned when he did not return on June 19th, the day he was supposed to return from his hike and the exact same day that his permit had expired so obviously something had happened now on june 21st his family had notified the park service and an intensive search of the entire perimeter around the reservoir and pacific crest trail was launched fortunately or i guess semi-fortunately however you want to look at it while they didn't find a trace of michael they at least found a backpack that was believed to be his near the Tiltil Mountain just off the trail containing a topographical map, a bottle of water, and a camera. Search and rescue operation involved personnel from several counties surrounding, including dogs, aircraft, and anything they could possibly expend for the search for Michael. Unfortunately, besides his pack, nothing else was ever discovered and nothing else was found. And now in 2022, it has been what? about 17 years almost to the date since Michael's disappearance and there is no remains to be found at all. And like the others, yet another person who just mysteriously vanished under bizarre circumstances. The cannibals were also a problem with Yellowstone at one point. For you see, on July 11th, 1970, law enforcement officers received a phone call from a distraught fisherman near Gardner, Montana, Yellowstone National Park's only year-round entrance. The caller claimed he had been fishing on the Yellowstone River when he snagged more than he had bargained for, a human body. The officer stationed at Yellowstone's entrance, a Deputy Bigelow, responded to the call. He and several volunteers waded into the waters and hauled out the corpse, which was missing its head. Bigelow knew a homicide when he saw one, and the county coroner and sheriff were soon on the scene. The victim was a male wearing only a pair of shorts. His legs had been taken off at the knees and his arms also taken off at the shoulders. The torso had displayed 27 individual stab wounds, including a giant hole in his chest. What's eerie is there was also no heart. None of the missing body parts were ever recovered as well. And authorities soon began to suspect that they might have found the remains of a 22-year-old man who had been reported missing. James Slosher had told people that he was traveling to Yellowstone National Park, but had failed to show up to work on a Monday. Two days and over 1,100 miles away, California Highway Patrol officers responded to a hit and run accident near the Big Sur. They eventually tracked down and apprehended one of the suspects, whom immediately offered a confession. I have a problem, he said. I am a cannibal. As proof, both men emptied their pockets, which contained human finger bones. The primary suspect was Stanley Dean Baker. Over the course of his interrogation, Baker had admitted to having hitchhiking alone near Yellowstone National Park, where he was picked up by a man in an Opal Cadet sports car. The same vehicle Schlosser had been driving. Baker said Schlosser told him he was on his way to Yellowstone and had invited him to camp with him that evening. And under the cover of darkness, Baker shot Schlosser twice in the head and then took care of the body. He ate the man's heart raw and saved his fingers as a snack for later. Uh, Schlosser, who was disposed of in the Yellowstone River, his car used by Baker to make his way to California. And along the way, 
he had picked up another hitchhiker whom he swore he had not been involved in the murder. Baker's story was corroborated by law enforcement after they had visited the site, which to where he had apparently had camped with Schlosser. They found plenty of evidence, like dried patches of blood, a hunting knife covered in blood, and more bits of the victim, including human bones and fragments and bits of teeth and skin, and even an ear. As if this story wasn't dark enough, Baker claimed his motivation for cannibalizing laid in his long-standing relationship with satanic cults, who had actually recruited him from a college campus in his native Wyoming town. Baker claimed involvement with the mysterious Four Pie movement, following its alleged establishment by a wealthy California businessman in 1967. The Four Pie movement was often blamed for the ritualistic deaths of both animals and humans all throughout California. Baker claimed first-hand knowledge of multiple human sacrifices, some of which he had perpetrated, all in the name of the cult's leader who called himself the Grand Chingon. There is some indication Baker may have also killed another man, San Francisco lighting designer Robert Salem, several months prior to cannibalizing Schlosser. Baker also told police that he, along with his fellow cultists, would not only consume their victim's flesh, but also drink their blood as a part of their satanic ritual. As further proof of his involvement, Baker displayed several tattoos signifying his enrollment in the cult. At the time of his arrest, Baker was carrying LSD and a satanic Bible. He would later claim that his devil worship had played less of a role in his homicidal behavior than the drugs had. In any event, both Baker and his traveling partner were incarcerated. The latter was sentenced to 10 years, but released in two. Baker, on the other hand, received a life sentence. Despite claiming that his odd behavior was drug-induced, Baker continued to act erratically in prison. He threatened the guards and was once caught with a homemade weapon on at least 11 different occasions. He supposedly continued to actively recruit for the cult, soliciting fellow inmates to join. Baker also claimed to be Jesus Christ and that it was not a drug overdose that had killed Jimi Hendrix. He had actually murdered the rock star telepathically from a prison cell in Montana, all with his mind. Despite the heinous nature of his acts, Baker was released in December of 1986 after being deemed rehabilitated enough to re-enter society. He faded into small town life where he allegedly became a top performing salesman at a sporting goods store before dying of liver cancer in Minnesota in 1994. Travis's story goes all the way back to when he was hiking in the Appalachian Mountains back in 2015. His plan was to go camping by himself out in the backcountry, but decided against the camping portion as to not being able to find a suitable place, so he still just wanted to go ahead at the trailhead and hike around and see what he could at least find. Maybe he could make a makeshift campsite with only his small tent and at least squeeze in a night or two if anything, versus a week-long stay like he had originally planned. The weather was perfect, light winds, about 50 or so degrees, and partly cloudy, enough for him to enjoy a lovely camping trip. At this point, he had been hiking for probably about three or so hours and did not see anybody else on the trail he was on which apparently wasn't that uncommon for the area, since the further you get out on this specific trail, it's much more secluded from civilization. As he continues his trek, he notices something very odd in the forest, and that's everything around him had begun to grow eerily quiet, besides his own footsteps crunching over twigs and leaves along the trail. And what's interesting is this portion of the trail is thick with underbrush on both sides, and usually, at least all throughout the morning, he can hear birds singing and wildlife erupting with noise and life. It's as if they had all fled or just seemed to go away. And the deeper into the woods he traversed, the more eerie things became and the more his hairs on the back of his neck began to prickle, like something was wrong. And the more he realized that it's like every living creature had vacated this part of nature, like rats leaving a sinking ship. At this point, he's probably close to four hours into his hike, and he's been experiencing the strange, eerie silence for probably a little over an hour at this point. He comes to an opening where he can see a small flat area, probably about 30 or so yards wide, and on each side, where the trail was, there was some rock outcroppings protruding from the ground. Up ahead from his vantage point, he could then see what appeared to be a large, black dog crouched on the ground behind some of these outcroppings as though it was kneeling down doing something. 
He continues upwards towards this opening where he's watching this in front of him, trying to understand what he's looking at and can't, and realizes the closer he gets that what he's seeing is a wolf. But he's trying to understand that, no, this isn't a wolf because we don't have black wolves this large. And he noticed the way it was sitting and crouching was strange. And as Travis began approaching it more and more, it stops what it's doing, turns its head to look directly at him from this far. And instantly, Travis feels dread in his stomach as this thing is staring right at him. Now, his words is that this thing had these glowing yellow eyes and blood all over its muzzle. So clearly it had been eating something. So Travis stops staring at this thing as it's staring back at him and he's looking at it, realizing that it clearly looks like an incredibly large timber wolf that's all black, but it's just not making sense what he's looking at. And so he's thinking, is this just a large black bear? Am I just not seeing this thing right? Are the shadows somehow obscuring what I'm looking at? And then it just seems to turn its head away from him, showing complete disinterest in Travis and going back to what he can assume to be tearing and ripping at whatever dead animal it's eating on. But Travis, now stopped in his tracks, realizes that whatever he's looking at, he just has a feeling that things aren't right and that all the noises around him are still dead silent, which again only happens when a large predator is in the area. And his gut instinct is screaming at him that he needs to go now, things are not what they appear to be. So as he's stopping, still trying to observe whatever he's looking at in an attempt to justify that it's probably just a mutated black bear or something, he begins to kind of slowly backpedal and hoping that it won't turn its head again. But as he's backpedaling, this thing stops yet again, looks back over in his direction. And this time, Travis said, this was easily the most terrifying moment because what he thought was a large timber wolf was now not a timber wolf at all. And then it stood up on two legs like that of a man and appeared quite comfortable and was not moving awkwardly or had a hard time holding up its balance. Now it's obviously very common that black bears can erect themselves up on two legs, but the way this thing moved, its gait, its bone structure, it did not resemble that of a black bear at all. And Travis has seen a plethora of black bear throughout his life. And this was simply not it. This was like a well-defined bodybuilder, a tapered waist, clearly defined dog legs with hawks, and a very large chest, bulging pecs and biceps. And this thing wore an expression on its face like it was pissed at Travis for even daring to interrupt its mealtime. And so he said it slowly began coming in his direction. And that's when Travis decided to book it and not even caring at this point if running from it would trigger the response of a natural predator to give chase to a prey. He decided to book it for about 20 or so minutes where he was finally able to rest, noting that the area around him was still dead silent and all the animals still appeared as if they had vacated the area. But fortunately for Travis, he did not see any signs of this large wolf-like creature anywhere around him but he did make note that he felt watched the entire way back down this trail all the way back to his car, which lasted the rest of the day. So he believes that he was being followed by at least this creature or at least another one of them, and that the sounds of the woods did not return at all the rest of that day, even as he made his way back to his car. Going back down the trail, he had run across several groups of hikers, but decided not to make mention to any of them of what he had experienced and they also appear not to be alert or aware of the lack of sounds around them, which should have been a huge red flag to anybody. Travis went on to mention that he had a secondary experience, which was much more terrifying in July of 2018, when he had gone up to a friend's property in Eastern Pennsylvania, which is still in the Appalachian mountain range. Travis's friend's property is kind of out in the sticks, so it took him roughly about 40 or so minutes to drive out there, and he has lots of open fields and he has a stable for his horses. He kind of has a smaller house, but it's got lots of property and acreage surrounding it. His closest neighbor being maybe a mile plus away. I mean, he is out here. And it was during Travis's stay with this friend that they experienced something they could not explain that had terrified his friend. So he had shown up to his friend's house on a Friday evening and they had stayed up to probably about one or two in the morning and drinking out by his fire pit and just having a good old time reminiscing on old hilarious memories as friends do. And finally, they decided to go inside for the night and get ready to shut things down. When out of the blue, Travis and his friend began to hear this strange screaming noise coming from the horse stables. 
both him and his friend go out there and they find one of the horses the dead. Going around to the side of the stables, they could see that something with immense strength had actually torn the stable door off, gone in and gone into this particular horse stable, ripping the door off and slashing the horse's throat inside open and had somehow managed to vanish within two minutes time from the time it took them to leave the house and get to the stables. Immediately, both Travis and his friend felt like they were being watched, but more importantly, felt like they were being stalked by a large predator. They both assumed that it was a mountain lion, but as Travis and his friend are now looking down at this dead horse that had just died, along with all the other horses who are beyond panicked and scared, the gash marks on this horse look far too big to be coming from a cougar. And just in that moment, they hear a large crash that sounded like a small tree being ripped out of the ground, probably about 30 feet in the yards to the east, which is directly on the other side of the stables. Travis and friend turning their light and attention to face the east, where they can clearly see out of the stables into the woods, they are met with these two glowing yellow eyes looking back at them, reflecting from the eye shine. And both Travis and friend are completely terrified by what they see. While they can't exactly see in detail what they're looking at, they can see a clear outline of whatever it was was humongous, at least over eight feet off the ground, having a massive, what they describe as a canine-like head, holding onto one of the branches staring in that direction without asking any questions and not wanting to fire off on an unprovoked predator at that point, they both retreat to the house, lock up, and they both have their firearms and they are ready for war. Now, the rest of the night, they could hear this thing crashing and screaming all throughout the woods near the house. And at one point or another, actually comes up to the porch and tries to open the door by prying it open. Travis and his close friend are completely beyond terrified and he is immediately reminded of the strange creature he had witnessed up in the Appalachian Mountains only two years prior. And at one point during this morning, it was looking through the windows at them. And that's when Travis and his friend got a pretty good look at it and described it to look like something from hell. This thing spent the remainder hours of the early morning before the sun came up, going around the house, scratching the side, making all sorts of hideous noises and screams almost making false attempts to break in but never actually tried, which led Travis and friend to believe that whatever this thing was, was never originally trying to break into the house. No, these were all highly intelligent fear tactics meant to intimidate and scare Travis and friend, in which they both feel was completely demonic in nature. Travis stated that the creature he saw two years ago up in the Appalachian Mountains looked a little different than this one, and that this creature that him and his friends saw looked far more evil, far more pissed off and much larger, as well as being pitch black, like so black that it absorbs the light around it. Travis speculated that it was him who had brought this creature up here with him, not literally, but his friend had never had any problems at this place, who had already been living here at least three or so years at this point, and this was Travis's first outing to this property. And the one night that Travis is here, this thing out of the blue shows up. So maybe that thing from the mountains attached itself to him, or maybe it's attracted to him or what, but it doesn't make any sense. And once the morning had come, there seemed to be no more signs of this thing. And Travis and his friend felt like it was safe to go outside and make sure that his livestock and other horses were intact and okay. And while the rest of his livestock and horses were completely terrified and on edge, the only one that had died was that one horse in the stable, which they were not able to get to because this thing was out there all night. His friend was beyond traumatized, unsure of what on earth they had just encountered the night before, not even being able to speak of it because what are you going to tell the police if you call about it? So he just had to write it off as a large mountain lion that had tried to attack his horse and was successful. Whereas Travis speculated that this thing only came onto his property because of him and that again, he feels somehow Whatever it was he saw in the mountains two years prior had attached itself to him or had marked him in some way that this thing would again follow him out here in Eastern Pennsylvania. That's just his theory and he has no evidence to back that up, but he's just not sure why out of the blue this thing appears on the very first night that he shows up on his friend's property. Several weeks go by and he checks in with said friend and this same friend had no other experiences after that one night. In fact, everything was back to normal, things were calm. It's like after Travis had left, the animal's fear level had dwindled and everything went back down. 
Of course, the friend buried his horse and has really no way to explain the events that were nearly supernatural that had occurred that same night. Is Travis completely full of crap or did him and his friend truly come face to face with a supernatural alpha predator of the deep woods? Our last story is submitted by Glenn. And in the fall of 2019, in Spruce Flats Falls, which is a rocky hiking area around a forested mountain creek, including a waterfall with a swimming hole, he was hiking with his dog and a friend who was also an experienced hiker. They were on the Spruce Flats Falls Trail about a quarter mile from the road. They have hiked that trail many times and know it well. There's a creek crossing about a quarter mile from the upper Tremont Road. The trail crosses the creek and then follows it up the hill for a bit. They were on this section of the trail when they noticed something. They walked around the edges of the trees and they started noticing a sort of electrical charge to the very air around them. Almost like the kind of feel when you approach a large electrical substation or a charged active radio antenna. Glenn has experience working in radio and electronics for a lot of his life and so they both knew what it was. They both felt this strange electrical charge but it was strongest around the trees in the creek. They also noticed a very pungent, almost rotten egg smell. This wasn't the first time that they had noticed this odor in the forest before. It was a very distinctive smell. They had also noticed that the birds and insects were completely silent. No chirping, crickets, or frogs. Glenn's friend and him looked at each other and said, something's not right here. In a non-silent agreeance of facial expressions, they continued to walk up the trail, but very slowly almost as if they were anticipating something to happen or like they were wading through water. They felt as if their movements were somehow being slowed down and even their dog was still and unusually quiet, almost frozen or slowed in pace. They kept looking around ahead of them when they noticed that the trees were swaying now as if a wind was blowing them, but there was no breeze and they could see no cause for the strange movement. As they got closer, they noticed the source of the electrical charge and smell and noticed movement in the trees above them as if something he described as camouflage was moving up to the trees, going down, jumping into the river. They stopped moving and looked up into some very large trees. The limbs were large and they could see that they were not moving, but something was shaking them, that it was almost like a flash of something big moving from tree limb to tree limb, shaking the trees and that it darted down into the creek. At that point, they had both had enough and decided to head back down the trail. They took their time and as they got closer to the creek, they noticed there was now something in the water that wasn't there before. It was partially obscured by some rocks, but what they saw was this translucent thing floating in the water. It was roughly about four or five feet long and had a very distinct long shape to it. Glenn and friend have seen many animals in the wild, including bears, but this was nothing like a bear or any animal they had seen before. It appeared to have a head, but was not distinctive enough to tell what it was. It kind of appeared to be a body that was tapered into the head, and they could not really make out a color since it appeared to be semi-translucent, but it kind of appeared as if it had scaly skin or something on top of its body. Then it began to turn in color and became very dark, and slowly it began to erect itself out of the water and grow darker and more firm in color. And Glenn knows this sounds crazy, but he swears that it resembles a mantis being of some kind and recalls it being very tall and skinny. It had arms that seemed to have a slight elbow to him, but more looked like the front legs of a praying mantis. They were very long and it was still partially submerged in the water. Immediately, his fight or flight kicked in, but he was frozen in place. Its head, now almost what he would describe as taking formation, began to look at both him and his friend and it stayed perfectly still in the water but that its arms began to sway back and forth very slowly, and he could not look away from it, and him and his friend were frozen. This thing had now fully erected itself out of the water and was staring at Glenn and his friend, inspecting them almost like a cat would a mouse that it's about to eat. Immediately, his muscles felt numb and tense and this electrical whirring feeling buzzing all around his body. Whatever it was had temporarily disabled his muscle movement somehow. He felt like he was going to vomit and became extremely dizzy and lightheaded. He could not move and his friend described the same thing. And it slowly began to move up out of the water, swaying its arms back and forth. And now he could see the front arms were very long, but they had a slight bow in them. It was now very dark in color, almost black. He could see no mouth, but had bulging golden eyes and was clearly looking in their direction. 
Its head stayed still, but the body was slowly moving forward, like it was almost changing shape as it moved, in a very slow motion. He said that it reminded him of a camera recording in 120 frames per second, where it's very slow, fluid motion. And the more he looked at it, the more he described it looking like a mantis. And as it began to drift towards them, it slowly became translucent again to the point of fading into nothing as it approached them. And as soon as it had become fully translucent again, the electrical whirring around the body had stopped altogether, and both Glenn and his friend could move again. So they turned and ran all the way back to the car, and they have never felt that kind of fear like that in their lives. They have both seen many animals in the wild, and this was not any animal that is known to man. It looked hideous, and he believes this thing was either cloaking or doing something like that. He has also seen UFOs and believes that this was some kind of mantis being, but is not sure what it was doing there, but that it seemed very interested in Glenn and his friend, but he does not know why. It did not seem or come off aggressive to him, just very curious and almost like it was studying him. He knows that this area is also a hot spot for cryptid activity, paranormal activity, and Bigfoot activity, and wonders if there is a connection between them. Glenn is a very experienced outdoorsman and hunter, and he knows the woods, mountains, and animals like no other person that he knows besides a couple of his friends. But this one has Glenn stumped. He has seen a lot of the things in the wild, but this has left him with more questions and no answers. So what did you guys think of today's episode? Be sure to let me know in the comments below what you think. Are these all true terrifying accounts of real things? Or are all these accounts merely works of fiction? And if you enjoy this video, don't forget to slap that like button and don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below to make sure that you never miss a single episode I release every single day, Monday through Sunday. As always guys, keep an open mind. I love you all and I'll see you guys in the very next episode. If you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button and leave a comment down below letting me know your thoughts and opinions. And as always, guys, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that subscribe button and keep your notifications turned on as YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the next video.